Welcome to CAA's Columbia at Home series. We're so glad you can join us this evening. My name is Elisa Charters and I am the president of the Latino Alumni Association of Columbia University, known as LACU, which is also a CAA shared interest group. I'm also an alumna of SEPA and I'm married to a Columbia Business School alumnus, Brian Charters. Tonight, we're joined by Carolina Quijano of Exquisito Chocolates. Carolina is a 2010 graduate of Teachers College and was already a chocoholic when she traveled to Paris on a business trip during her Wall Street consulting job that had her flying 150,000 miles a year. She tasted a delicious life-changing chocolate and then spent the next two years trying to recreate it in her tiny New York City studio apartment while still working her demanding job on Madison Avenue. Hundreds of recipe trials later, she took a leap and she moved to Miami to start a chocolate factory to make her chocolate dreams come true. Today, Exquisito Chocolates sources direct trade cacao beans from over eight origin farms in Latin America and the Caribbean, making bean to bar chocolates using only the highest quality ethically sourced beans. So near the end of this program, which is very exciting, we'll have an opportunity for Q&A and you can even use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. And we'll try to do as many questions and answer as many questions as possible in the time we have. So I'm pleased to welcome Carolina to Columbia at Home. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you so much for uh, taking the time to spend some time and learn some more about chocolate and become uh, absolute chocolate snobs. And hopefully uh, at the end of this, be able to make your own chocolate treats at home. So I'm extremely excited to share the time with you guys. You can smell all the aroma come out when you crush them, which is really nice. All those beautiful chocolate flavors. Chocolate is, is happiness. It's something that can, you know, really soothe your mind and soothe your soul. I think for a long time we've grown up with this idea that chocolate is either dark or sweet and that's it. Chocolate can be a lot more, just like wine, just like fruits. So this is basically how we receive the cacao. The beans themselves are already fermented and dried, and we bring from different farms throughout Latin America and the Caribbean, and we keep them all single origin. So chocolate is a fruit. It grows on trees. It comes from the cacao pod. Inside, you'll find a pulpy fruit that is called baba. It has the consistency of soursop and then the flavor of a lychee. In our case, what we're looking for is the actual seed part, and that's the cocoa bean, what ultimately will be transformed into chocolate. This variety that we have from Peru is from Marañón. It's considered to be one of the rarest cacaos in the world. It was thought extinct for about 100 years, and it grew wild in that time. It actually looks like milk chocolate because about 40% of the beans themselves are uh, considered white beans or kind of caramel colored. And then over in Guatemala, we also receive this variety, which uh, tastes a lot like oranges because they grow a lot of oranges on that particular farm. So each farm and each country and even specific regions have different flavors. We have chocolates that can be nutty, earthy, fruity, and that's all coming from the soil where it's grown, but also the bacteria that plays a role in its fermentation. We will hand select all of the best cocoa beans for us to use. We're really looking to take out anything that's not a cacao. Sometimes you get twin beans like these. What will happen is they won't roast evenly. At the end of the day, we're trying to make a, a better product than what's uh, been commercially available. So to us, this is very important. You'll notice all these fissures inside the bean. And then that means that when the bacteria came in during the fermentation, it really broke down the cell walls and it let all those flavors mix in. So that's what we're really looking for is uh, color, flavor, and fissures in terms of quality of cacao. 
So we'll pat it down just to make sure it's even because we want an even roasting. What happens in roasting is something called the Maillard reaction. The amino acids and the sugars start to interact with the heat and it starts to develop the flavors and also the aroma that comes from the cacao. So similar to sort of searing a piece of steak, the same is happening with our cacao in that process. We let it cool down usually for a few hours. You have the shell, which is called the husk. And the nib is ultimately what becomes chocolate. So a lot of people think that dark chocolate is bitter. And the reality is when it's bitter, it's typically over roasted, which means that it's burnt. That's why we medium roast. It's lighter, it's fruity, you can taste all these different things. And when we do chocolate tastings, people can really appreciate that we have an Ecuadorian that tastes like raisins. We have a Guatemalan that tastes like oranges. And then we have our Haitian that tastes super earthy. So then we let the cacao rest from roasting and then we'll want to winnow. And that process is simply cracking the bean and removing the shell. You'll notice is most of the shell goes out towards the outside and then the nib stays in place because of how heavy it is. So this is the machine that we use now. Shock has sort of been monopolized for so many decades. So there's not really equipment that we can use as small craft producers. We have a champion juicer from Amazon and then we have a shop vac from a Home Depot. And the way it works is just like I was crushing it with a hammer, the champion juicer will crush all the beans. And instead of blowing air into it, we have a vacuum which has that same method. As the beans drop down, they're crushed. As air sucks in, it'll take that lighter shell or husk up into here, and then that heavier nib will fall down because it avoids the air that's blowing in there. to 20 percent of the bean itself is husk which in most places becomes uh, trash but we actually don't throw out a single piece of husk so one of the big ways that we found a home for them has been in beers it produces a different layer of flavor when they ferment the beer with it you can actually brew tea with it and it tastes almost like this uh, earthy hot chocolate so we're going to pre-mill it in order to make it a little bit smoother on our conching machine The friction is creating heat and the heat is activating the cocoa butter that's present in the bean and that's what will cause it to liquefy. It starts to resemble uh, when you start making brownie batter. So now that same cacao now suddenly is liquid. This is what we would call a chocolate liqueur. It's just the nib broken down. So. It's almost like a very chunky peanut butter, very, very astringent, you sort of feel here. The texture is quite gritty, so we would need to smooth it out, add sugar, if we're gonna make milk chocolate, add milk, um, in order to transform it into the chocolate we're used to. I spent part of my childhood in Barranquilla in Colombia. Chocolate for Colombians is simply made. It's just very, very good dark chocolate, and that was something very satisfying and something that I really enjoyed and stuck with me for many years. And then from there, it'll go into our refiners. So originally, these machines are actually uh, nut grinders. So they're used primarily in India to make nut butters, uh, sometimes with uh, peanuts. In this machine, you find two giant stone rollers and a granite slab. And what they do is two things. One, refine down so it's smooth, it's velvety, like we're used to with chocolate. The other thing it's doing is a process called conching. And what it does is air is continuously moving in and out of the mixture and aerating it. So very similar to when you open up a bottle of red wine and you let it breathe, we're doing the same thing with the cacao. All of those tannins, those volatiles are evaporating as air comes in and it makes the chocolate milder as the process runs. We'll let these run for about four days straight and it'll refine everything down. So this is the sugar we'd use. It's unrefined, has more of a molasses taste to it. It sweetens the chocolate, but doesn't overpower it. In this middle machine, we're making milk chocolates. We added also cane sugar, a little bit of cocoa butter for texture, and then we added milk powder because we can't add any sort of liquids or anything that's water-based into our mixture 
Otherwise, it's sort of like when you add water to flour, it will really not work well with the molecules in the cacao. And then in here, we're making white chocolate. The one thing we don't have is any cacao nib. So this is primarily based off cocoa butter, unrefined cane sugar, and milk powder. So typically, when you have milk powder, it's this color. I'm not a huge fan of that type of white chocolate, so we like to do something here caramelized. We actually take this milk and we slowly roast it in the oven. It has a, a nice toasty note to it, which is really delicious. When we take the chocolate out of the machine, at that point it is couverture, and that's when most places would buy that finished product in order to make their items. We use a, a filter, which is actually meant for like honey, and it's catching any nibs that we didn't refine, and that way we have a final smooth product. When you're producing tons and tons of chocolate each year, you have to buy from a bunch of different places and blend it together in order to sell quantity. Those companies want the chocolate to always taste consistently the same. So when you over roast, you can maintain a consistency uh, and then you can mask it with things like vanilla so that that's always what consumers taste. In big manufacturing, they're typically connected via tubes and chocolate has to travel from one side of the factory to the other. So they'll use a lot of times lecithin to help it run smoother from one side to the next. So it's really a, an aid in production. We Well, I hope you guys really enjoyed uh, taking a look at a behind the scenes of what a week in our chocolate factory looks like. Um, as you can see, it's a very, very labor intensive uh, process, but one that we um, really want to uh, showcase what the farmers do through each chocolate that we make here. And that's something that's extremely important. Uh, the sustainability aspect really brings forth a, a better tasting chocolate, but also, uh, you know, helps us, uh, you know, create a, a business model where we're able to, to give back uh, a process and a system to the farmers involved uh, that is adequate and provides a living wage. So uh, the machines that you see right behind me, those stone melanders you guys got to see there, uh, those are two of the ones that we use here. Uh, I, am, I am quite short, uh, despite the angle that you have right now. Uh, these machines tower over me a bit, typically. Um, these are uh, each one 200 pound machines, so we can make 200 pounds of chocolate at any given time. Uh, one of them right now is running our Mexican origin and the other one our Ecuadorian origin. So we treat chocolate very much like we do wine. So tonight what I wanted to share with you guys was the very first recipe that I learned to make. It's something that you could very easily make at home. It's something that's fun. Um, with this basic recipe, you can have a lot of fun and take it different directions. And I'll give you some tidbits and some ideas as how to work with it. And it's just a very easy two ingredient recipe on how to make your standard chocolate truffle. So tonight what I'm gonna show uh, you how to make is a basic ganache. And a ganache is just a fancy term uh, for uh, chocolate that is melted and combined and emulsified with uh, dairy typically, but I'll discuss a few alternatives that you can use. And then once you blend them together, it creates this very velvety, creamy chocolate, uh, almost like a sauce, but it eventually uh, semi-hardens and you're able to roll them and make different treats with them. So you're gonna wanna start with two basic things. So the first thing is um, we're gonna be using heavy cream here but you can actually uh, swap this out for uh, coconut oil. Um, you could use also coconut cream, which is one of my favorites if you're going more of the vegan route. Um, if you are uh, lactose intolerant, you could also use um, almond milk. You can use uh, soy milk. Just keep in mind, those tend to be a little bit more watery. So you'll want to just cut that down a little bit so it doesn't provide or create too liquidy of a um, ganache there for you where you can't work with it. The other important ingredient is dark chocolate. So I am using uh, a 73% that we make here. Um, this one is from Ecuador. It's one of my favorites. Um, it's very fruity. Um, it, recommendations, just stick with a dark chocolate. If you go to your supermarket, um, you can find uh, Giardelli, which is a good recommendation. Steer clear 
of any of the little chips and morsels because those typically are not real chocolate. So you're going to want to work with a really nice chocolate. If you go to Whole Foods or maybe, um, you know, a nicer, uh, you know, more diverse uh, supermarket, you can find also Valrona, you can find uh, Guitard, and those are some great options, uh, which are also just basically uh, vegan just by production. So the first thing you want to do is always you're going to have um, eight ounces of chocolate. So if you have a measuring cup at home, that's the equivalent of one of those. And then we're going to use half of that in your dairy or in your plant uh, based uh, liquid. Okay. So you're going to take the eight ounces of your chocolate and we're going to want to melt that down because we want to make sure that we can combine it smoothly with the rest of uh, the ingredients. So my recommendation is either take a knife or if you're able to break it down just by hand, try to roughly break it down into your container uh, prior to melting, just because chocolate's a little bit like popcorn. It's very easy to burn it and it's not salvageable. Once you do that, it, it won't smell well at home. I can tell you that. And you're gonna have to toss it away. So make sure you can break that down. You have two methods of melting down your chocolate. My preferred method is the microwave. It's a little bit safer from the other Bain Marie technique that a lot of people like. So just put it in your microwave for about 15, 20 second increments. Every microwave is very different. You wanna make sure not to let it go over. And all you're trying to do is just trying to get your chocolate down to be melty, okay? You don't want it to be super hot. You just need it enough where it's in a liquid form, all right? The other method, perhaps some of you have heard, it's uh, Bain Marie, where you basically take, um, you know, a pot and then you fill it with water and you start to boil that. And then you just put a bucket um, or a, um, you know, some sort of bowl on top and you can pour your chocolate right there. And obviously you don't want to apply any direct heat. So that's why you would never put the chocolate right directly into the pot. But if you put it here, it kind of gently simmers. And you can just take a spatula and very slowly uh, mix it in and it'll safely melt it down without overheating. The one issue with this, you just want to be careful, as I mentioned in the video, um, there is condensation that typically forms around here and chocolate hates water. So just make sure that if you do prefer to do this method to wipe down your surface, otherwise you don't want to introduce water into your ganache, you're going to have some issues there. So once you have your melted chocolate, what I would like for you guys to do is you can take your heavy cream or your coconut cream and then just also gently put it in the microwave. If it's coming out of the fridge, especially, you don't want to shock the chocolate with this cold substance. And you also want to take the same application. We're not trying to boil it. Um, typically, we're trying to get it to around 40 degrees Celsius. But in my book, as long as this chocolate is melted, all we want is for this to be almost at room temperature. So as long as you can tap it and it's no longer cold, but it doesn't burn your finger, you don't have a thermometer at home, that's a good rule of thumb. So also try to go with 15, 20 second increments if you know that your microwave is quite uh, you know, powerful. And what you're gonna wanna do is once your cream is um, warm and once your chocolate is melted, all you have to do is put your cream into your chocolate and we will emulsify those things. Now I'm gonna use a stick blender and you can also, if you have a blender, just a traditional blender at home, you can use that as well. You can also use a food processor um, if you have one of those. Um, and if you are really adventurous and want to go the just spatula uh, method, I know sometimes not everyone has tools at home, you can do that too. It's, a, it's gonna be a little bit tougher to integrate everything but try to use something that has a little bit of a power to it. Because when you blend it, what's gonna happen is the cream is gonna go into the chocolate and all the fats of everything are gonna come together. And you're gonna slowly see how the chocolate and the cream come together to form one thing. You should no longer see any sorts of white streaks from your ganache, all right? And like I said, you have to be really careful to make sure that the cream is not overheated because you will actually uh, completely destroy your chocolate. You definitely don't want to do that. So just gently blend it, okay, until you see that it has become one. Once you have 
combined your chocolate and your cream together, you have successfully made your first ganache, okay? Now it's gonna be a little bit warm to the touch still. So what I always recommend is um, to cover it and then put it in the fridge uh, for a little bit because you wanna make sure that it sets before you start to actually roll anything, um, you know, if you actually wanna be successful at it. So that's something that I highly recommend. If you wanna go the quick route, because I know we all want chocolate, uh, yesterday, basically, you can stick it in the freezer for a little bit um, to help it set because you're really wanting to create a solid. So it's going to right now look very liquidy, um, almost still like melted chocolate for you. But I had prepped this um, earlier and I had put it in the fridge. And that chocolate that's very liquidy will actually start to look more like this. It almost looks like this uh, fudgy, almost like a like an ice cream consistency. Um, it starts to to be a little bit thick if you um, you know kind of push down on it. You'll know that the ganache is ready. What you're looking for is that when you push down on it, um, your you know your, your hand doesn't just sink into it because then it's going to be too soft for us to mold our truffles with. You're really kind of looking for uh, a little bit of tautness on there. Um, obviously, just be careful if you did put it in the freezer, you might have to take it out a little bit before then. But what we're gonna do is, if you guys have seen, seen your standard truffles, um, all we're gonna do, and this is the hands-on part, and um, this is the fun part, right? Uh, for those of you at home, what you can do is you can take a standard just spoon. Um, if you have a, a melon baller, that also works quite well. And all you wanna do initially is kind of form out what size truffles do you want? Now, do you wanna go a uh, more traditional route? Then you know, you'll know you wanna do something around this, which is maybe like um, you know a quarter of an ounce or so. Um, of course, if you would like to make one giant truffle by all means, the world is your oyster. But the very first thing that I want for you guys to do is to um, just portion out what your little truffles will look like, all right? So once you have those, they should look a little bit like this. Now, if your hands tend to run a little bit hot, just be mindful because they will melt a little bit in your hands. So just don't be afraid, put them back into the fridge, put them back into the freezer, let them solidify a little bit. And once that's the case, what you can start to do is just grab them and just roll them. Okay, this is a fun thing, activity you can do with uh, with your kids, with your family. Um, and the fun thing is everybody can kind of customize it to whatever they would like to have on their truffle. So once you have those nice and round, all right, what I like to do is I like to grab various toppings. So here you can get cocoa powder. Um, you can get, this, these are graham crackers. You can get uh, shredded coconut. You can get all sorts of, you know, almonds and peanuts, um, any sort of topping, you know, sprinkles, what have you, whatever is your preference and what you like to pair with your chocolate. And you want to make sure that they're not super melty. We can just kind of grab them and they won't, uh, you know, melt away. And once you have that, all you're going to do is just kind of pat them down with the topping itself. All right. And then the truffle itself will grab onto any of the toppings that you have. So in this case, um, you know, I've made one with uh, with coconut here. We had one with a little graham cracker. You just roll it around and they will stay set like this. These have been sitting out here for now about two hours uh, with no incident. So you're able to really play around a lot with the outside part of what you're making based on your own preferences. Now, once you have this basic recipe, the cool thing is you can really play around with it and make a few different things. So maybe you're not a fan of dark chocolate, you can actually uh, take this and use a, a milk chocolate base um, and you can replicate that same uh, recipe. If you guys are into boozy chocolates, I'm somebody, I, I love uh, good booze and good chocolate together, something that we love to produce here. So. If you're a fan of um, champagne, uh, we love working here with rums, uh, with cognacs. Uh, what you would like to do if you want to infuse your truffles with any sort of alcohol 
is put that into the cream before you heat it. Never apply the alcohol into the chocolate itself because you will ruin the chocolate. Uh, as I mentioned, water and chocolate are natural enemies. Alcohol does have water, believe it or not. And um, it will, the chocolate will actually look like concrete if you try to do that. So always just make sure if you're gonna put alcohol, put it into the cream, heat it up and then add it. Um, I always suggest add the taste, um, but in the proportion that we're working with today, which is eight ounces chocolate to four ounces of, of dairy, um, I would go with a tablespoon and then you can adjust accordingly to the alcohol you're using, but also to your own preferences. Another idea as to something, you can infuse cream uh, with a bunch of different things. One of the favorite things that we like to do here is cafe con leche um, to sort of give a Latin twist to our truffles. It's one of our top sellers here. So the nice thing is that cream is a blank canvas where you can really steep a lot of different things. I myself am more of a tea drinker. So I love uh, steeping tea. We just made green tea uh, bonbons this week where we steep the cream with uh, the green tea itself. And the cream will actually taste like that. So your bonbon will taste that way. What I took here was that same four ounces of cream that we had been working with earlier. But what I did is once I heated it up, I added about 15 grams of coffee to it, um, which is just a handful if, uh, if you don't have a scale at home. And just cover it with a little plastic wrap, let it sit for about 20 minutes and automatically the cream is actually gonna start to smell like the coffee. Once you have that, just take another little container, a strainer, pour that over, all right? Filter out the beans from the cream. And then just like you did with the traditional basic dark chocolate truffles, you can actually use this cream to make those truffles, but now it will taste like coffee and you can have coffee based truffles as well. Um, this will work just as well with uh, coconut cream, with almond uh, milk, with any other sort of uh, dairy alternative. So um, no worries there, but it's a fun little way where you can uh, infuse different types of flavors um, into your chocolate uh, without necessarily having to add it directly into the chocolate in the case of tea, which would not be very appealing to crunch into. So once you have your truffles, once you've had your fun with them, um, just store them in an airtight container. Um, they obviously have fresh uh, dairy in them. Um, you know, all of the dairy-based and plant-based will have water in them. So you just wanna make sure to store them in the fridge. They'll typically last airtight for about two to three weeks, um, as long as you're storing them properly. Uh, but, you know, in the case that, that we find most of the time they don't last that long because chocolate is very tempting to have around. So uh, that's a, just a good rule of thumb. I know a lot of people ask about where to store their chocolates, truffles, go in the fridge. I would advise just again storing any of your chocolate bars in the fridge since we do tend to store onions and garlic and all sorts of stuff in there and chocolate tends to adhere to it. So just something to think about as we go forward. So I, I really hope that, um, you know, that offers like an insight into what seems like this very luxurious treat, but it, it's this very basic uh, recipe. It just calls for good ingredients and a little bit of patience. And at the end, you'll be rewarded with a, with a wonderful activity, but also a great treat. Um, fun fact, uh, when I was in, in graduate school, uh, at Columbia, I, this was actually my gift to all my friends. Uh, I used to make uh, chocolate truffles in the dorms and that was my, my Christmas present to everyone. Trust me, like people will absolutely love it. So uh, I hope you have a lot of fun with it. I'm more than happy to answer any questions as it relates to maybe the recipe that we uh, had uh, today or how to modify or anything like that, uh, or anything chocolate related, I'm more than happy to help uh, answer any of those questions. Catalina, thank you so much. This was just such a fantastic way for CAA to launch Columbia at Home with you and Exquisitos Chocolates. 
Um, the video uh, about your company was just so beautifully done. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but my mouth was totally watering when uh, we were watching the process of the chocolates being made. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. We'll, 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 I guess, break up our questions today based on the actual chocolate making process. And then also, you know, your personal experience of being uh, a Latina entrepreneur and, and um, a business owner in Miami and launching in Miami and, and, and all of those steps in your journey. So, um, so let's start off with some of the questions about the chocolates. Um, so you talked about uh, champagne, putting champagne in the chocolates. Um, you know, what about dipping and glazing chocolates? Do you have any insights that you can share about that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, with the recipe that you use today, you can actually uh, use it to, to dip a few things. It's going to be a little bit softer than your front of the mill chocolate. One of the things that we didn't get to cover in the video is uh, chocolate requires uh, tempering. So if you're going to just melt that same chocolate in the microwave and dip something um, and you let it harden, it'll actually turn whitish on you. So don't don't do that. Um, one of the things that we do here is we, we temper the chocolate, which all that means is we melt the chocolate down to about 108 and we slowly cool it down. So it's something you can do in the microwave at home, um, you know, get your chocolate to about 100 degrees uh, and then slowly bring it down with a little bit of uh, cold chocolate. And then you can use that to dip things in it. If you want to go the easier route, which is cheating a little bit, but still works, is um, you can actually introduce a little bit of uh, coconut uh, oil um, into the chocolate just a little bit, and it will kind of skip through needing to temper your chocolate altogether. Um, but you'll definitely want to do one of those things as long as it, as long as you're using real chocolate. If you're using, um, you know, any sort of chocolate candy stuff, then you can go ahead and melt that and use that directly. Well, your demonstration was extremely thorough, and I love the fact that you had some, you know, examples of, of, of your product in the process. So that was very helpful for us as an audience to, uh, to learn. Um, and I have two more questions. Uh, one is, you know, if you used unsweetened chocolates, how much sugar do you add? And also, um, which is the best dark chocolate to use? Not brand wise, but like percentage of cacao. Yeah, so if you're using um, unsweet chocolate, it, it really depends on your own palate. Um, I mean, I'm someone that if you add 100%, which is just totally unsweet, like a baker's chocolate or something like that, and you add it to the cream, if you're adding something a little bit sweeter, like the brown cracker or something like that, you don't need that. Um, but if you are going to use any sort of sweetener and you're trying to steer clear of refined sugars, maybe add a little bit of honey to taste. Um, I, I think that's the best way. I'm somebody who I like the 100% all the way um if you it's more about you wanted to add your own sweetener i would already buy the chocolate with the sweetener because it's going to just create a smoother ganache for you so maybe do it like an 80 85 uh, with the cream it won't make it as bitter so maybe just try to find the percentage that you're comfortable eating but that also you're comfortable tasting uh in terms of the sweetness level Fantastic. Now, what about you, you had mentioned that you could use some substitute uh, substitutes of the heavy cream. I think you mentioned um, coconut cream. Uh, what about other vegan options? And then how do we adjust for the, um, the ingredient uh, amounts? Yeah, so if you're using uh, coconut cream, it's something that we'd use here to make uh, pina colada bonbons. Um, it, it works, that one the same proportion as your cream. So you're gonna do two parts chocolate to one part um, of, your, of your dairy or in the coconut cream in this case. Uh, you can use um, almond milk. What you're gonna to wanna to do in that case is just cut it by about a quarter because it, it tends to be a little bit more watery, a little bit more runny. Um, and obviously if you just wanna maybe pour some ganache on top of uh, you know something else, it's fine. But if you're gonna do the same technique, just cut it by about a quarter. Um, so um, just to make sure that it doesn't get too liquidy on you, you can use soy milk, you can use any sort of anything 
any sort of dairy, any sort of liquid um, or plant-based dairy that you use, um, I, you know, you can use the same way. Just cut it back a little bit um, by about a quarter if it tends to be on the runny side. Okay, great. And, and, and a similar question in terms of sweeteners, what are the alternative sweeteners can you use and which ones don't you recommend? Somebody had asked about monk fruit. Um, you know, what, what are the variations and possibilities? Yeah, so I, I, what I see and what I see works well is, uh, for example, honey um, inside the, the cream itself. You can use monk fruit. We've used it here successfully. What you want to just do is make sure blend it into the cream itself, because you definitely don't want any of that chunky, uh, you know, bits of sugar in the, the ganache itself. If you're able to find a chocolate to start with that already has monk fruit, I know there's several out there on the market. Um, start with that. It's just going to be a lot easier to work with. But otherwise, just add it into the cream itself and just blend it thoroughly. Um, before you put it into the chocolate itself. Okay, um, now in terms of storage of the chocolate, uh, let's talk about shelf life and let's also talk about how you would like prepare the chocolates to actually store them, whether you're storing them in the freezer, the refrigerator or your pantry. Yeah, so the most critical thing when you're storing chocolate and when you're storing uh, chocolate truffles in particular, because they do tend to be very sensitive uh, you know, they're going to last about three weeks or so. Um, so the most important thing is once you have your, your chocolate truffle, so the best place to always store them is in your stomach, of course. But if that's not an option, what you're going to want to do is just get an airtight container. Um, so just like, you know, Tupperware, just place them in there. Um, if you're going to store them into the fridge, that would be sufficient. If you want them to last longer, you can actually put that into a Ziploc bag put it in the freezer, and then before you're ready to eat, just put them down into the fridge, uh, maybe two hours before that, and they will actually extend their shelf life. So uh, you won't have any issues there. Okay, um, I think, oh, there was, someone asked if you could just quickly repeat the coffee-based truffles, yeah. uh, what you did in that in that process. Absolutely, so um, remember we were, working with four ounces of cream to make our basic recipe. Um, so what I added was I used whole beans. Uh, you can also substitute it for instant coffee if you don't have whole beans. I would deter um, from using ground coffee just because filtering it, it out is gonna be a bit difficult unless you have like a cheesecloth or something, but we just grabbed the, the whole bean and it's about 15 grams. So it's close to about like a handful um, into those four ounces, which is about half a cup. Uh, if you warm up, pretend like you're making almost like a coffee with this. So warm this up like you would for your truffles. You put the coffee beans in there, cover it, set aside for about 20 minutes. And that applies as well for teas if you wanna do that. And then once you have uh, those 20 minutes pass, just strain it um, over a colander and use the cream itself, okay? So this will be free of the beans, but it will already be steeped and will smell a lot like coffee. And then just blend like we did into the chocolate itself and you'll have some cafe con leche truffles. Okay, well, we're gonna ask one more question about the chocolate making and then we'll move on to some of the questions relating to, uh, you know, the business launching and the like. Um, so can you add more milk to make the truffle taste more like milk chocolate? Uh, also, do you add more sugar? So if you want it to taste more like milk chocolate, what I would do is instead of using a dark chocolate like we did tonight, is just buy a milk chocolate. Um, I know you asked about percentages. I use the 73%. Um, I, in supermarkets, usually my rule of thumb is if it doesn't have a percentage, it's not real chocolate. So try to stick with, um, your deli at like the supermarket has like percentages on them. Otherwise, um, you can use a, a semi sweet That's usually in that ballpark of in the 70s. If you're looking for something sweeter, especially for kids, by all means, substitute it for milk chocolate. Um, you can, um, you know, just find like a good milk chocolate to, to add to it and it won't have any issues. I would deter you from adding sugar into it because you, then you're going to get into that the crunchy ganache part. So just better to start with the level of sweetness that you would prefer 
um, for your truffles at the end. Um, and I would say go with a, a milk chocolate. You can even do them with white chocolate as well if that's more your jam. Um, you know, we, we love white chocolate for like passion fruit um, and um, rosé and things that are more mild to the palate. So there's no snobbery here about using white chocolate, so. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your patience with all of these fantastic questions. Um, I'm sure many of us are going to try to make these truffles. I know I am. I'm so excited about learning this. Uh, and thank you, you know, for your thoroughness in explaining how to, uh, to master making truffles at home. Uh, so moving on, you grew up, uh, your parents were in their own family business. Uh, what lessons did you learn you know, through working with your parents as, as a young person? And then also, you know, how did you evolve to go into Columbia and how did that impact your overall experience professionally and as a, an entrepreneur? Yeah, so I grew up in a very entrepreneurial household. Uh, both of my parents had their own business. Uh, I grew up in the back of the warehouse, uh, basically doing my homework there. So I got to see you know, what it takes to have your own business, the great part of it, right? And then also the difficulty when, you know, when things need to get done, it's, it's up to the business owner to be there and, and, you know, how critical that is and how important, you know, I saw them uh, work tremendously hard um, at what they built. And, uh, you know, that was something uh, I, I used to go in and, and answer the phones when I was little and I could tell you what, what they would sell. So. Um, I had my business, first business card at nine, thanks to them, uh, because I actually created my own mini store within their store, um, selling the gift wrap uh, for people to, to use for their presents. So it, it was something that I always had this, uh, this hustle, um, you know, to sell things. Uh, I always really enjoyed the aspect of building something. I knew long term, um, despite having a corporate career that I wanted to at some point have my own business. It definitely was not chocolate, I can tell you that. Um, I really thought it was going to be more of on the corporate end, but as you mentioned, um, I had this aha moment where I just absolutely fell in love with chocolate and the possibilities of what it could be. And as I started to go more into that, I started to encounter the notion that chocolate sort of undergoing this renaissance, much like coffee and craft beer did 15, 20 years ago. And myself and, and others in the industry are trying to not only disrupt uh, an industry that's really uh, been monopolized by a lot of folks, but um, but also that we can kind of change how chocolate is perceived and how chocolate is enjoyed. So that's something that really excites me. Um, I, I came to Columbia as uh, to get my master's in organizational psychology. Uh, I went off to be a management consultant. Uh, really, the uh, there were no T-shirts back then uh, or baseball caps. But, um, you know, I learned a tremendous amount of things uh, throughout different industries about how to manage people, about how to run a business, how to build a business. And those were all something that I truly value and a foundation to, even though I'm working with chocolate now, I still will use a lot of those lessons learned, um, you know, in my own business and how I, how I manage my staff, but I also how I perceive uh, the growth of my business. So. Um, it's definitely not something that's abandoned. It's just something that's built on in a different perspective and in a different industry altogether. So now also, you know, that transition from being in a stable corporate job in a career that's flourishing, you know, how did you plan to make the launch into starting your own business? And, you know, what, what kind of parameters did you give yourself in order to make that transition? Yeah, it was a, it's a scary leap, I, I will say. Um, for me, when I had that aha moment, I, I spent the first two years just tinkering and seeing, you know, what is it that, uh, that I thought I could do. And then once I had all that together, um, what I, you know, I had been saving up until that point, and, um, you know, I, I kind of had a, a number in mind as to what I needed as a cushion in order to make that leap. But the other thing is, I, I promised myself, I said, all right, if I leave now, I have two years. Uh, I said I would give myself two years um, to test this out, enough time to kind of make the mistakes, to uh, test out, to you know, to react to what I needed to, 
and to see if I could grow. And what I was looking for was one of, you know, two things. Uh, the first being, you know, could I even, they even make chocolate and that people liked. And second, was it something that was scalable? And that was something that I, at year two, um, was a critical uh, decision of, uh, okay, do I keep doing this or, or do I go back? Uh, obviously it's, it's nice to have that experience in your back pocket where you could always, um, you know, rely on that. We, we hit two years uh, here at the factory last summer. Um, obviously in a very challenging year, um, I was very fortunate because um, I had been planning a, a strong pivot towards the online market and it just hit at the right moment um, because we were prepared. Um, I believe Lint was not even, didn't even have a website when COVID hit, which is like insane to me, but we were, we were there, we already had everything built out. And when people were at home, chocolate was the number one um, indulgence uh, last year in terms of chocolate. And, um, you know, we we're very fortunate that we were there to, to, um, you know, take advantage of that or, you know, be prepared for that. So uh, I was able to hit those two years with, uh, you know, with growth, with a good outlook, um, obviously with a lot of question marks as to what's going to happen going forward. Um, but it is something, uh, it's still day by day. There are moments when I do wonder what have I done with my life, but you know, who doesn't have those moments? Um, but for sure, something that's, uh, it's been a journey, it's been a, a roller coaster, but it's also been something that's been, uh, you know, truly uh, a great journey as well. So two more questions. Uh, speaking of pivoting and going retail online, how can people get your product? How can they purchase it? Yeah, so you can find us at spc.chocolates.com. Um, I think I'll try to put a link in the chat shortly. Um, and I also, if you use uh, Columbia University at your checkout, you get 50% off. So please take advantage of that. If you've never explored us before, that's your best bet in terms of getting our stuff. Um, we also work with uh, several like well-known brands. Uh, we're working with Salt and Straw Ice Cream now um, that will, starting this Friday, uh, online sell our ice cream, our SEC the traffic ice cream from their brand. So you can find that as well. And if you're in the New York area, you can also find us at other half brewery. They, uh, a lot, any of their chocolate beers in the DC and New York area are made with our stuff. So if you're more into beer and ice cream, you can find our stuff. And when you support them, you support us as well. So. Perfect. So, you know, this is the Columbia at home program you are at home in Miami. You know, tell us a little bit about why Miami, the excitement of Miami, the future of Miami, being in Little Havana, having an urban factory. Uh, you know, I love that you have the Cafe Con Leche truffle that's, you know, a bestseller. Talk about the Latin authenticity and what that means to you as a Latina business owner. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh... I'm not from anywhere. I grew up all over the place, but the two places that always, uh, you know, spoke to me uh, was my time in Miami and my time in New York. Um, a lot of that having to do with just the, the diversity around both places, uh, the excitement, the curiosity. Um, for me, when I was in New York, uh, I mean, just from a, a very basic standpoint, uh, starting your own chocolate factory, I'm self-funded in New York is a little bit harder. Uh, to be honest. Um, so Miami, what I love is that there wasn't anything like this here. Um, there's a lot of excitement around Miami. It's very much an emerging food city. So there's still a lot of that where us, as we come in and we bring something new, we're able to grow with the city uh, gastronomically, which was very exciting. I'm in Little Havana. Um, for those of you who may have visited Miami, it's the place with all the roosters around. Um, it's obviously uh, initially was the neighborhood that uh, the Cuban diaspora came into. Now it's uh, Salvadorian. There's all sorts of Latin folks here. And what uh, I loved about it is um, there's a bunch of uh, you know Latin self-owned places that are doing amazing, innovative food concepts in this area. And it just seemed like it was the right fit for us. Um, there's obviously, um, you know, just a great deal of 
exciting new things coming into the city and it was something that I really um, thought was a great fit. Um, always with the mindset of eventually also having a presence back in New York. Last Christmas, we actually did a pop-up right at Columbus Circle for the month of December. And hopefully once this is all over, you guys, uh, if you're in the New York area, you can come see us again at Columbus Circle when we host our uh, holiday market for the Christmas season. Well, we certainly hope so too. <laughs> Um, you know, thank you so much, Carolina. We're so proud of you. Uh, and uh, we, we, we couldn't think of a better way than to launch Colombia at Home than to do it with Exquisito Chocolates. Thank you for this, this wonderful presentation, um, for the tutorial. And uh, I hope that we can, uh, we can certainly match this with another Colombia at Home program because this was excellent. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. And like I said, make sure uh, you could use your Columbia University uh, discount code and get 15% off our site. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, hope you guys uh, learned a lot. And if anybody has any questions afterwards, feel free to reach me. Um, there's a contact page on our website and you can go and ask all your chocolate uh, questions there as well. Wonderful. So now I'm just going to make an announcement um, about the next Columbia at Home program, which will be on January 27th. Um, they've rescheduled the Get in Shape at Home with Flexit Fitness, an overview of virtual fitness in the industry, and some tips and routines on staying fit at home. Uh, we'll be joined by Flexit operators, Austin Cohen, a graduate of Columbia College and Columbia Business School, and Justin Turetsky, a graduate of the School of General Studies. And that's going to be at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and everyone can register at alumni.columbia.edu. Thank you again so much, Carolina. Thank you to the audience for joining us tonight, and thank you, CAA, for this wonderful program. Have a great night, everyone.